All right. If you brought your Bibles, uh, please get them out. Turn them on. If they are electronic, head on over to Luke chapter 2. We're going to be continuing our series through the Gospel of Luke. We're going to pick up the pace just a little bit. We took our time going through chapter 1. I think we took five weeks on chapter 1. We're only going to take three on chapter 2. But Luke here gives us this very simple and straightforward and unembellished and uses unembellished language to describe the most profound birth with the most far-reaching implications in the history of of the world. Now, if you're a parent, you're like, oh, he's describing my kid's birth. No. Your kid's birth may have been profound, was definitely special, but your kid's birth is nothing like the birth of Jesus. This child that's going to be born in this story was unlike any child who's ever been born before and since. This child was the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, deity in human flesh, the God made flesh. It was Israel's long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of the world, and in Jesus' birth, God entered human society as an infant. The creator of the universe became a man. We have what John describes as the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And so let's not lose the significance of this birth today. We often associate Christmas with gift giving, don't we? Unfortunately. Uh, And it seems like every year, and I know you guys are going to think I'm a huge hypocrite for saying this, but it seems like every year Christmas music and Christmas decorations are, are getting sooner and sooner in the year, right? No joke. I think it was late July, early August, I saw Christmas decorations at Costco. A little part of me was like, yes, but then a part of me was like, oh, no. And then when I was growing up, it was the Sears and Roebuck catalog. That was the big thing. It was like a big phone book that you got, and you flip through for your gifts and all of that, what you wanted to get. get, uh, get. But this year, they're, they're coming in the mail now. So we got the Amazon one this week. Anybody else get this this week? Yeah, what's it say? Share the joy. I don't see Jesus in here. I see a lot of circles with stuff that my kids want. Um, I see some stickers and stuff, but I don't see Jesus anywhere in here. And so when, when we read through this story, you're going to hear the word joy come up. And this is not the joy that we're talking about. All right? So let's look at Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And we're going to read through verse 20, uh, and then we'll come back and kind of walk through the story. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Whew. You guys know what just happened in that story? Jesus was born. The Savior of the world was born as a baby. And Luke, in verse 1, he grounds his story, this true story, this retelling of the events in the real world, in real history. He mentions Caesar Augustus and the governor of Syria. This is not a once upon a time story. This is real. This actually happened. It can be verified and has been verified by history. This Caesar Augustus that was mentioned here, aside from Jesus, is one of my favorite characters in the Roman world. Uh, he was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. And after Julius Caesar was, uh, was killed on March 15th, um, he had not uh, Octavian was Caesar Augustus's name. He had not Julius Caesar had not told Octavian that he had adopted him because he was his great nephew. But so word got back to Octavian that, that hey, Julius Caesar adopted you as son. You are the heir. All of the other parts of, of Julius Caesar's family are no more. You are now Caesar. In 19 years old when that happened. Can you imagine that? Here in the United States, how old do you have to be to be president? 35, right? Now you've got a 19-year-old. He took some time. He get, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> Spoken like a mom. All right. So after, after uh, this, the, the, the Roman Empire was kind of split into, into three. And slowly Octavian kind of knocked one person out. And then he was going after Mark Anthony, who had paired up with Cleopatra in Egypt and defeated them at, at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. Uh, and then... Uh, he became the emperor. But it's not just the fact that this was a real person in real history, that Jesus came. What you have here is you have Luke setting up a story that's the clash of two kingdoms. You have the kingdom of the Roman world, the, the human earthly kingdom. And then bur bursting onto the scene, you have the king of kings, lord of lords who's going to usher in his own kingdom, a different kingdom, with a different kingdom culture. So this is the beginning of that confrontation between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. And, and in these verses, you also have a parallel between John the Baptist's birth and Jesus' birth and, and the announcement of the births. And, and, and John's birth was, was, was important, but it wasn't given nearly the attention that Jesus' birth was given. Because Jesus is superior. You have an angel, one angel that announced the birth of John. But here in this passage, there's a multitude of angels that proclaim the birth of Jesus. And so you see that, that the Caesar Augustus had decreed uh, a census should be taken. And so everyone was going to their own town to register for this census. The census was for tax purposes. Uh, the Roman uh, army could not conscript the Jews into their military, which was another reason for a census. But this one had to do with money. So Caesar was like, I need some money. So let's find out how many people are here so I can get my money. And so that led... To verse 4, where Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary. And all the pregnant women who have been pregnant said, what? You're going to drag me 80 miles away from my home when I am nine months pregnant? I have to ride on a donkey or walk? Um... What? Uh, it's hard enough to get pregnant ladies into a car to go for a short car ride to the hospital, let alone an 80-mile donkey ride. She was, walking. she was walking. He was he was walking for sure, right? 
but went with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. You see, the Romans, they were in control as far as human authority goes. And they exerted that human power, and they forced people to move around and, and to go register for the census. But the Romans did not recognize their limitations. In reality, God controlled this. In all times and places, God works His will for the good of those who love Him. God didn't write Roman law, but He judged it. God did not soften the bumpy road down to Bethlehem, but God gave strength to Joseph and Mary. Interestingly enough, God's in charge of your life, too. That God will provide all that you need. And, and like Mary and Joseph, we live each day on a day-by-day -day faith, trusting that God is in charge. So even though the government had forced Joseph to take a long trip to pay his taxes, that his fiance had to go with him, and they were going to have a baby at any moment, and they arrived in Bethlehem, they couldn't find a place to stay. Uh, we kind of have this vision in our head that they went to the inn and there was a grumpy man that said, there's no room here, no room here. That, that's not biblical reality. A lot of times those people would stay with family or friends. And so they, since they were from that area, they probably had aunts and uncles and family and friends in that area that they just, there wasn't a room for them. There was no guest room available for them. So they would have ended up in that kind of this public area. Um, and there would have been, a, a lot of people think there was a cave that they stayed in that they gave birth as where, where Jesus was born. It's really interesting. Doing God's will often takes us out of our comfort zones. You think Joseph and Mary wanted to go 80 miles, nine months pregnant? No. They were pretty comfortable in Galilee. Nazareth. But they had to get out of their comfort zone. Jesus' life began in poverty. Later, Jesus would stress to his disciples what it meant to have no place to lay one's head. Those who do God's will were not guaranteed comfortable lives. We are promised that everything, even our discomfort, has meaning in God's plan. So despite those popular Christmas card pictures that show this beautiful scene where Jesus was born. It was actually very dark. It was very dingy. It was very dirty. Not the atmosphere that the Jews expected for the birthplace of their Messiah King. They thought that their Messiah would be born in a royal setting, born in a palace with a bunch of people around to help. So you and I, we should learn and we should not limit God by our expectations because God is at work wherever he's needed in this sin-darkened world. But when Jesus was born, he became a gift to the world. And I love the way Paul describes this gift in 2 Corinthians 9.15. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Indescribable. I'm still going to try to describe them, so here we go. Verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now, you and I read this, and we're familiar with the Christmas story. We know that the shepherds, they were out there watching the fields, and there was a bunch of angels that showed up, and, and this big picture. But you and I don't really understand what's going on here in the story, because we don't really have a concept of what a shepherd was. Shepherds were the bottom of the social ladder. They were uneducated. They were unskilled. They were viewed in society as being very dishonest and unreliable and unsavory. They could not even testify in court. They worked seven days a week, so they were not able to observe the Sabbath, along with all of the, 
the man-made rules that the Pharisees came up with. But since they worked seven days a week, they were also never able or rarely able to go to the temple to observe ritual and ceremonial cleanliness. So they were really the, the lowlifes, the scum of the earth, the least of these. But here's the deal. There's two, there was more, there was a lot. But Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. In the Old Testament, God is described as the shepherd of Israel, and Jesus is going to be later described as the good shepherd. So shepherds, even though they didn't have a huge standing, that, that their testimony wasn't well received, they were still beloved by God. And by visiting the shepherds, the angels reveal the grace of God towards mankind. That God does not call just the rich and the mighty, but he calls the poor and the lowly. And that should give us hope. Amen? Another thing that happens with Christmas is we get a picture of Jesus as a baby in a manger, right? Here's the deal. Jesus grew up. <laughs> he didn't stay a baby. Right? If you've ever had a kid, you know they don't stay babies. Right? They start walking. They start crawling. They start getting into things. Don't let the baby in a manger be our last view of Jesus. Because we cannot leave him there. This tiny, helpless baby lived an amazing life. He came and he died for sinners. He ascended into heaven. And one day Jesus is going to come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Grown up Jesus will rule the world, will judge all people according to their decisions about him. And so if you still have this picture of Jesus as a baby in a manger, he has not become your Lord. Do not underestimate Jesus. Let Jesus grow up in your life. Don't be like Ricky Bobby. <laughs> you don't get that reference. That's awesome. <laughs> Glory in this passage refers to the evidence of God's majestic presence. In this these verses and in, in the next verse, we're going to see some significant terms that reoccur over and over and over again in Luke's gospel. This idea of bringing good news, of proclaiming the gospel, of preaching. Luke uses that word more than any other writer in the New Testament. We hear words like joy, people, great joy for all the people. But things are going to happen today, that there's a Savior, a Lord, and glory. This angelic announcement is a seedbed for essential ideas that Luke traces throughout the rest of the book. And then we get to one of the most beautiful verses in the Gospel of Luke, and that's verse 11. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. <sighs> How cool is that? A Savior is and was exactly what mankind needed. Even the pagans in the first century sensed this need for peace and a savior. Epi Epictetus, uh, he was a first century pagan writer, he said this, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns for more than even outward peace. That's a pagan saying that around the same time that Christ was born. Verse 11 is the heart of the gospel message that we proclaim to the world, that all people are sinners in need of a Savior. And that Savior is not us. That Savior is not the government. That Savior is not our money. That Savior is not our spouse. But that Savior is the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. But Jesus was just born. And he's being called the Savior. The death of Jesus allows him to be 
our Savior, the Savior of the lost sinner. And that is why we cannot have a baby picture of Jesus, that we have to have that grown up picture of Jesus. But here the angel proclaims that, David, that, that Jesus is going to be a Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. So what do each one of those mean? Savior means that God sent his son to redeem the sinners, and that will bring us great joy. Listen to 1 Peter 1.8. You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. When someone becomes a follower of Jesus, when they trust him for that Savior, there's something that changes in their life. They become happy. They become more joyful. They become a treat to be around. Not always, but sometimes. Most of the time. Matthew one twenty one said that, that uh, when Jesus was given his name, this is early in Matthew, this is the, 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 as Jesus was born, it says, he will be called Jesus because he will save people from their sins. Later on in Luke chapter 19, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Don't ever forget that you are in need of a Savior. It's not a one-time thing. But it's an ongoing, continual, day by day, I need saving. I need saving for myself. I need saving from my selfishness. I need saving from those people around me who would hurt me. So there's salvation, past, present, and future. But it also says he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's the anointed one. Jesus was anointed as king of kings. Jesus was anointed as the high priest. Jesus was anointed as a prophet. He's the anointed one. He is also Lord. He's also Lord. There's a lot of churches that are afraid to talk about the lordship of Christ. Because sometimes we try to earn our way to heaven by proving that Jesus is Lord of our life. He's already Lord. This is just simply recognizing and being subservient to him. Why are they so afraid to talk about it, though? Because they don't want to encourage you that you have to work your way, that you have to prove that Jesus is Lord. They get the cart before the horse. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? For you have been saved by grace through faith, not of yourself, lest anyone can boast. But we often forget verse 10. You're God's workmanship, created to do the good works. Don't miss that order. Grace, saved by faith, to do good works. If you flip it to do good works, to prove that I am saved, you're wrong. As followers of Jesus, we recognize that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God. And then we get to verse 13. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So after the angel had spoken, we don't know if it was the angel Gabriel, it probably was, but we don't know for sure. After the angel spoke this, then all of a sudden, a great company, a multitude, a myriad of myriads. And this was fascinating. So prior to, or at this time, they, they didn't really have numbers like you and I have, like these big, huge numbers. Um, so the myriad was, was just kind of like the biggest number that they could think of. And so here you have a myriad of myriads, so infinity, infinity showing up. It's really cool. All of heaven broke into praise after the angel gave the news that Jesus had been born. The angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. Later in Revelation chapter 5, John gets a glimpse of this again. And he said, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousand and 10,000 times 10,000. There had not been very many times where the angelic host had broken through from the spiritual realm into the physical realm and had given us this picture. Isaiah was one. It happened to him. And it happened here and it'll happen again in Revelation. Like, this is a special time. This is cool. But they didn't just announce that Jesus had been born. They announced that there was going to be peace on earth. And oftentimes... 
we repeat this at Christmas time so much that we think it's about quiet tranquility or the absence of animosity between people. But this is a declaration of the coming end of hostilities between a holy God and sinful humanity through the atoning work of the Messiah, that we will have true peace with God. And that Jewish word shalom means much more than truce in the battles of life. It's well-being, it's health, it's prosperity, it's security, it's soundness, it's completeness. It has to do more with character than your circumstances. And life was difficult at that time, just as it is today. Taxes were high. Unemployment was high. Morals were slipping lower and lower. The military state was in control. Roman law, Greek philosophy, and Jewish religion could not meet the needs of men's heart. And because of that, God sent his son. Peace to those on whom God's favor rests. In Romans 5, Paul describes the peace this way. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You are no longer an enemy of God's. Romans 5, uh, two, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Keep praying for peace on earth. But more importantly, be peace on earth. Be peacemakers. Because as followers of Jesus, you have the light and love and life of Christ within you. And so you are peace wherever you go. There's a Christmas song in there. Oh, there is. Verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, oh, can you? so the shepherds, right? They're just, they're tending their flock. It's kind of getting, it's evening. They're probably trying to fall asleep. And then all of a sudden you have an angel that declares this. And then the multitudes show up and there's all this light, the glory of the Lord shown all around them. Then the angels leave and, and they're like, Whoa, what just happened? Like, did you see that? Did you hear that? Like, I just think that's so cool. When they had left him, uh, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Did you catch that? Instant obedience to the word of God. Instant obedience. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph. We don't know if they found someone to watch their sheep or if they were just like, we're out of here. We got to go see this thing. <laughs> right? It's so funny when um, uh, Cora was born. She was born at like 1.30, 1.45 in the morning. Lindsay knows the exact time. I don't. But uh, I think it was 1.48. Uh, we, we, we knew that, that we were going to have the baby and we had called our parents. They were a couple hours away, but we told them all, we don't want you to come for a couple weeks. Just give us some space. Um, so I texted everybody at like 2 in the morning, like, hey, she's here. Send them this cool baby picture, right? Um, and then like 6 o'clock in the morning, in walks Lindsay's dad. He's like, I came. I, I got the news. We're here, right? We got to see the, and they only stayed for like an hour, and then they drove two hours. Home. It was really, he just wanted to be the first to see the grandbaby, right? But what's exciting, like, it was one of those things. Let's go see this thing that's happened. Let's hurry off. Let's, let's, let's go see. This was the first Christmas rush, if you will. And, there, and there's something that happens in verse 16. So the, the shepherds, they get there. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. Now, now the, the, remember, he was whopped, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. That was to be their sign that this was the baby. So most babies at those times, they were wrapped in those, those, those swaddling clothes. Um, but the manger was, was the interesting part. It was a feeding trough for animals. Um, uh, and it, it's, so they found the baby. But then they sat and talked around with, with Mary and Joseph. We don't know what they talked about, right? It was probably like, hey, the shepherds are probably like, you would not believe what happened. And they're like, oh, try me. Like, an angel showed up? Oh, yeah, he did. How'd you know? Well, <laughs> showed up to both of us, too, at different times. It's been weird. Uh, what the angels say, and then they got to compare stories and compare notes, right? But they, they, the shepherds, they just, they left here, and they, they had this, they were compelled to tell 
the good news, to spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Not just what the angels had said, but probably what Mary and Joseph shared. And it was amazing. It was amazing. You and I, we need to be the folks that are willing to spread the word, to tell others about our spiritual journeys, to tell others what Christ has done in our lives. And we tell others not just with our words, but with our actions, right? Like, that Christ has saved me, that Christ has changed me, that Christ has given me a new heart. Every time Lindsay and I go back to our hometown, almost every time, it's happening less and less, but every time we go back to our hometown, we run into people that we knew in our BC days. And they're like, you're a pastor? What? What, um, what did I miss, right? I'm like, well, you missed Jesus. It's the only thing that's changed. So the shepherds, they went out and they told everybody everything. So those are the extroverts in the room. We get to verse 19, and all the introverts said, Amen. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. For treasuring things, it means this deep reflection. It means keeping in mind and safely storing up. And then pondering in the heart means mulling it over and over and seeking to understand and interpret. And so that's why we believe that Mary was, was the source of this information for Luke, that Luke was able to sit down as he was investigating the life of Jesus, so that he sat down from Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that's why we have Mary's uh, song in, in, in chapter 1. That's why we have these details here in chapter 2. Not only should we be the people like the shepherds that spread the word, but we need to be like Mary that treasures and ponders Jesus' life in our hearts. And then verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Their lives, these shepherds' lives, were marked by a newfound attitude of praise and worship. And what struck me as I was studying this week they only knew about the birth of Jesus. They didn't know about the life of Jesus. They didn't know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And yet their life was full of praise and worship. How much more should praise and worship mark our lives? Because we know that Jesus not only was a baby, but he grew up. He took the sins of the world upon him. He paid the price that you and I could not pay so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so we can have a relationship with God, so we can have a right relationship with others, so that we can live a life worthy of the calling, live a life as followers of Jesus, live in the freedom that he gives us in Christ, not to be a slave to sin anymore, but to be free, truly free. I would encourage you to highlight all of Luke chapter 2 and read it on Christmas Eve this year. Beautiful story. So what, now what? In light of this birth story of Jesus, this Christmas story, what are you and I to do? First of all, believe that Jesus is your Savior. If you've never trusted Christ to save you from your past sins and continually save you from your present sins, now is the time. Believe, trust, rely upon him. Submit to Jesus as your Lord. We all have those areas of our lives that we want to keep from him, but that's not who we are in Christ. That's not our identity. Jesus already has the keys to the house. He already knows what's in every room. We just need to submit to him. There may be something going on in your life that is causing you heartburn, it's causing you tension, give it to the Lord. Give it to Him. Finally, I want you to treasure and ponder the wonder and majesty of God. It never gets old to worship Jesus. All right. So, even though we got rid of the tables, we're still going to have some time to talk amongst ourselves. So, if you're new here, what we do, we used to have tables and we'd sit around and have a table talk but now you get to move your chairs. They're not locked for a reason, so you can move and get together. If you're not comfortable talking, that's okay. You don't have to. You can just say, Scott told me I didn't have to talk. I don't want to talk. Or just say pass. Okay? 
Uh, but I, I, the first question is really what I want you to look at. The second one was more for me than, than anybody else. But how do you think you would have reacted if you had seen what the shepherds saw? So if you had witnessed heaven open up and then declare the glory of God, how would that have hit you? And then finally, what's your favorite Christmas carol? All right. So let's take uh, five minutes or so and talk about this. Groups of three or four, uh, two, three, four, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, and we'll get back together here in a little bit. We've been kind of building a, a, a list of, of we are a people who, these are kind of identity statements based on the passage. And so for this one, we are a people who believe we need a Savior and Jesus Christ is our Savior. As part of our identity as a church, part of our identity as Freedom Church is we are a people who need a Savior every day, every hour, every minute. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. Not us, not the government, not money, but it's Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good, and we are so thankful and grateful for the birth of Jesus. We're thankful for the story, the true story. We're thankful that the kingdom of God is, was brought into the world uh, as a baby. We're thankful that Jesus grew up, took the sins of the world upon his shoulders, and died for us so that we can be reconciled, we can be redeemed, we can be forgiven and set free from our sin, and from everything else that comes after us. We trust you. Amen.